sit down. Here's your host, Dr. Michael Hamm from New Mexico. I'm your host, Michael Hamm, and I'm here with Dennis Dinge. And Dennis Dinge is running for Congress here in New Mexico. We really appreciate you coming, speaking with us, Dennis. No problem. I'm sure I will enjoy it. At least I hope so. We, we do too. <laughs> and Dennis actually took some time out from a long distance bike ride that he was a part of today. I can't tell if we gave him a break or if he gave us a break. Yeah, I was doing a fundraising bike ride today for, for charity. Now, I'll leave it at that. I don't want to seem like I'm exploiting the fund, <laughs> right. fundraiser because I'm and, not. Uh, it's, something I, it's something my wife and I signed up for before I decided to run for Congress, and it, it wasn't going to get dropped. So you got to take a, a break from campaigning every now and then. Yeah, that's right. You've got to stay sane, and it's really yeah. cool. And Dennis has already done 50 miles on a bike this week. All right, well, let's jump into the issues of the day. Obviously, we've had a pretty big news day last night, and so let's even start with immigration, right? Right. Immigration is something that's on everyone's mind. I'd be curious to get your take on what you would do if you were elected to Congress. What I would do on immigration, first of all, it depends on whether or not I'm running as a Democrat, depends on not whether or not I'm in the minority or the majority. The recent news about getting real protection for dreamers is very concerning. And from a practical point of view, it's it doesn't make sense. There's only a finite number of dollars to enforce our immigration laws. And if we're going after the dreamers and we're spending the money to separate them from their families and to move them out of the country, that means that we're, we have to be spending less time and resources going after folks that have a criminal record, for example. Where less time and resources are spent on people who aren't playing by the rules. And I think what the Trump administration is doing is expensive and it's cruel in that it's going to separate families. There are lots of cases where the children were born in the United States and they are U.S. citizens and families are going to have to make a choice of whether the children are going to be deported with them or somehow they're going to be left here. Yeah, those are heartbreaking instances daily yes. that we hear about. So what the Trump administration is doing, in my opinion, is expensive and it's cruel. What we need is a pathway to citizenship for the dreamers a pathway to permanent residency at the very least for those who came here over 18. And we should look upon this not as amnesty. I hate that. I hate that word amnesty. That's not what it is. We should look upon it as a plea bargain, a type of plea bargain. These folks should pay into the system. I would have them pay directly to Social Security. That's something we all want to shore up. They would pay into Social Security for a few years. And what I propose, they pay into Social Security for a few years without getting the benefits for those first few years when they retire. That's, that's an interesting idea. That, that's, a, that's like a plea bargain. Right. You think about it, if someone broke into your house, especially if it was a, a first offense, which is much worse than coming over the border to watch your kids and mow our lawns, right? Right, absolutely. They Come would get a plea bargain that was, was, was probably, probably a fine or a probation or something like that. That's a practical way of handling the problem. It's a type of way of handling the problem that we do for other folks in other situations everywhere in this country. And that's what we should be doing. We shouldn't be spending tons and tons of money, you know, rounding up kids who keep, whose only crime was paying attention and doing what their parents said, which is what kids are supposed to do. And these, you know, assuming that, you know, they, they play by the rules, they get good grades, especially if they're in the military or they're willing to join the military. Absolutely. I can't believe some of these folks have been deported who are military veterans, right? That's just um, I hadn't heard right. that. But if that's true, that's that's kind of ridiculous. So that's my take on immigration. OK, I think it's very good. And, and this sounds actually like a bit of a disruptive idea, right? This is new. I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone speaking of it as a plea bargain, right? I've heard the amnesty and I've heard the emotionally charged language that has come to surround this. But yeah. this sounds like a really, maybe a disruptive idea that more people could get behind. I, I hope so. I hope more people can get behind this as a, as a concept because I really don't want to spend billions and billions and billions of taxpayer dollars deporting people who are actually producing things and contributing to our economy. Yeah, now. Right. The thing I I dislike most about undocumented folks being here is they can be exploited. That's the other side of this. They can be exploited. They can be paid lower wages than people who are here illegally. Yeah, and that's been the argument that people have made who are against illegal immigration is that it's suppressing wages because they can be paid less, right? And so, as you say, right, right, and and I I want these folks to come out of the shadows and become part of our economy legitimately. And I don't want them to be exploited in a way, especially in a way that that drives down wages. 
Now, this idea that any type of immigrant, undocumented or not, is bad for our economy and they're just some sort of takers is patently ridiculous. That has never been true. It wasn't true when my ancestors came over on Ellis Island, and it is not true now. When someone comes here and they create something, whether it by, it's by the sweat of their brow or a click of a mouse, that thing that they created makes our economy more valuable. If they build something that wasn't there before, it makes our economy more valuable. If they write some software or they do whatever they do, this, this concept that having more people producing things, and that's what immigrants do. They come here and they produce things. That's right. I've worked with many immigrants in my life, and they, they work yeah, very hard. Yeah, they do. The concept that that is bad for the economy is a false concept. There is no evidence to back it up, and it is patently untrue. So, and, Dennis, I'm sorry to interrupt you on this, but sure. when you were talking about uh, programming, you actually have a background in computer science, right? That's one of the reasons we contacted you. Close. I do supercomputing. Supercomputing. Okay. My degrees are in electrical engineering and physics. Okay. I, I got into supercomputing because I did astrophysics for my PhD, and astrophysics is done on a supercomputer, so I got real good at using them. And I work for a company called Cray that brought me to New Mexico, and I've been here ever since. I, I work at one of the national labs now. I've been here for 11 years. Oh, very cool. Yeah. So you have this scientific background, and one of the reasons that Politics Within Reason is interviewing you is because we're really trying to get these people engaged and get more exposure. One of the one of the real problems with running is just getting exposure right. So without saying something crazy to get your name in the media, we're hoping that there's a real place for people who have reasonable ideas. And I guess a question to you is, what do you think scientists could do differently in politics that we don't see today? Well, scientists, they have a lot of traits that some, maybe but not all politicians have. It is a prerequisite for science that you be honest. Everything we do has to be honest and provable. It has a it, paper trail, right? It has a paper trail. It, it has to be backed up by facts. It has to be things that you can prove. And that is the only way you can actually solve problems. And that doesn't mean you're not wrong in science. It just means that when you take a position, you have a reason and evidence to take that position. It doesn't mean that in the future you might find out that there's another explanation for it that makes sense. But the whole idea is that you aren't just making claims that don't have evidence behind them. Right. And, and, and the other thing you have to have, especially in, in, in physics, is you have to be able to think creatively about how to solve problems. You have to be a creative thinker. That is absolutely necessary. And I'm not saying that non-scientists can't be creative, but we have to be. And that's why if you take a bunch of scientists and you put them in a room, they will come back with rocket ships and cell phones and supercomputers. If you put a bunch of politicians in a room, oftentimes you come back with excuses and gridlock and nothing gets done. So on that point, right, politics is very emotional. Right. One yeah. of the one of the things that we have seen, especially recently, is that identity politics drives people to take positions that are outside of. Well, let's not call it reason, but let's just say that it's an emotional position rather than one that's well reasoned. And you're not open to having your mind changed. And so is there something that you think we can do to help move the conversation along? Let's let's talk about, for example, climate change. Right. The current administration is asking people to say weather extremes instead of climate change. And actually, I'm OK with that. I think we should start calling it man-made weather extremes. I think that helps highlight the what's actually happening a little more. But is just changing the language. Would that help with the emotion or are people just so entrenched that it's going to be difficult? Immigration is another problem. Right. 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 Well, I don't like identity politics. I like the idea that people form their political opinions based on the merits of whatever subject you're talking about. That being said, if you have a, an election where, like the last presidential election, where the news and the discussion is dominated about by what's bad about your opponent, what you know, what laws they may have broken, and all all these type of things, whether they're crooked or not, or how crooked they are. You don't give people. What they grab. Yeah, you don't. You don't, yeah, what they grab. Um, you don't give people the opportunity to have a discussion about the merits of your position. That's right. And one thing Democrats don't do enough, and they didn't do enough last year, is talk about why our positions will actually help people, how they will improve people's lives. So, if you're not going to have an election about identity politics, you have to make sure that you're talking about things that have merit that are important and. And talk about how it's going to improve everybody's lives. 
Okay. Well, on that line, right, what is your take on the healthcare debate, right? What, well, what do you I, think we can do there? I'm a single payer. Advocate for single advocate, payer. I'm an advocate for single payer. But there are a couple caveats to that. Uh, first of all, I don't think the blue states should have to wait for the red states to get single payer. And you don't support forcing the red states to take it? Well, not directly. I think we should have a system where states that want to can go to single payer and form a pool. Within those states, the private insurance companies should be able to sell across state lines into the states to decide to keep the current private insurance system. We should do this for four years, and then I think the voters in each state should decide what system they want to keep. It's an interesting Uh, idea. Well, I I think it's a path to single payer that people might get on board with. It's a competition. Americans love competition. Competition is good. The states are supposed to be the laboratories of democracy. Let them be the laboratories of democracy. Let them be the laboratories of the healthcare system that works best for them. Yeah, I think that's a great point. If Obama had, instead of trying to implement it through 50 states, just left it up to the individual states, I think there might have well, been a little bit more acceptance. I want to I want to path to single payer. Now, I personally think single payer is better because it's more efficient, it's cheaper, it can, it can deliver. It gets rid of a lot of the wasteful things in our system. It's also easier for businesses to start up, right? They don't have to be thinking about how am I going to do health care for my employees, right? Well, you know, it's an odd system where a business that doesn't do health care has to worry about health care. And nobody ever talks about small businesses losing employees to large businesses because they can't afford a health care plan. Yep. Nobody talks about when they talk about the cost of single payer health care. They don't talk about the fact that if you have single payer health care, if you have a large employer, they're all of a sudden not going to have to pay for your health care. You might get a raise out of that. Sure, Absolutely. they'll pocket some of the money. but And the overall system, because we pay someone to sell it, we pay someone to sell something that everybody needs. We don't do that for roads. We don't do that for clean air. We don't do that for clean water. We don't do that for, for lots of things that everybody needs. But for healthcare, we pay, pay someone to sell healthcare. We pay someone to transfer the cost of not having health care to people who do. When you go and you can't pay your health care bills, you show up at the emergency room, you get taken care of. Right. Eventually, after they send a bunch of bills out, they realize you aren't going to pay them. Then they transfer those costs. That costs money to do that. It costs, costs money. People who pay that it co- money. Nobody talks about doctors' offices aren't going to have to have specialized staff to mm. handle the relationship with the insurance companies. All of these things are at the root, not necessary to deliver healthcare. Doctors and nurses and lab techs deliver healthcare. Insurance companies do not. Right. They just pay for it. They they just they're, they're with a I, lot of yeah. middlemen. Yeah. What I'm well, yeah. What I'm talking about here isn't. An unfamiliar concept. Everybody knows this concept. It's called getting rid of the middleman. That is what I'm talking Efficiency. about. Efficiency. It's American. That, that's, right? that's, that's what, what I'm talking doing. about. <laughs> and healthcare is not a free market system. The way we implement it. No. The only way it could be a free market system is if when people showed up at the emergency room without health care, they didn't get treated. And we're much too good of a people to do that. We will not let people die for lack of health care. That's right. Even it Ronald Reagan immoral. signed the yes. bill that said you had to be treated. And, it, and it's incredibly ironic that the only place in America where health care is a right is inside of an emergency room. Everywhere else is not a right. And, you know, as an engineer or a scientist, I hate that type of system because it's an inefficient system. It's waste. Scientists hate waste. In that's, the system. that's a good point. So that's Science another way scientists can make a difference. Looking for this this waste that people refuse to talk about, right? Yeah. But these I, things you brought up are not part of the discussion about health care. It's not. And, and, you know, there are there's a lot of ways that single payer will benefit the economy. And, you know, people just need to be open to that, need to see it. So, Dennis, one of the questions I've had, right, is getting in contact with your representative is is easy, right? You can call their office, you can tweet them, you can email them. But do you have any new ideas for how you might be able to keep in contact with your constituents if you get elected or letting them get in contact with you? I love doing town halls. Okay. No doubt when the Democrats are in majority, they're going to do something that's going to rile up people to come to town halls. And I'll have town halls anyway. <laughs> Perfect. I'm glad to hear that. I, it's it's unbelievable that some of these Republicans are just hiding. Right yeah, now. well, you know. Talk about the tough stuff, right? And part of it is there's a lot of them are in gerrymandered districts. And if you're in a gerrymandered <coughs> district, you really only have to get 50 plus 1 percent of one party to stay in power. And that's a horrible thing. You can ignore most of the people in your district. You can ignore all the people from the other party. 
And you can ignore almost half the people from your own party. And that's a recipe for extremes. Don't get me started on gerrymandering. It's one of the worst forms of voter suppression there is. Because if you think about it, no matter if you live in a really strong Democratic district or a really strong Republican district, if you know that every election you're going to vote on in the next election, if you know who the winner is going to be ahead of time, why do you show up to vote? I'm not saying you shouldn't. But it's I, predetermined. It's, yeah. And and so there's a case before the Supreme Court right now from Wisconsin on political gerrymandering. And it's a huge case. I mean, people might not know about this. It is a huge case. Years ago, the Supreme Court outlawed political gerrymandering. And then they said something that a group of scientists would never, ever say. They say it's illegal, but we don't have a good test for it. So we're going to let people keep doing it anyway. And in Wisconsin, they actually came up with a mathematical test in terms of how many votes are wasted by the losing party. In other words, when you're doing gerrymandering, you try to take one party's voters and put them all in a district or just a couple districts right? so that they win by huge margins. And in all the other districts, the party you want to win wins by a smaller margin. Right. So, so they you have more winning districts from the party you're trying to uh, yeah, rig the yeah, system yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. You, can get, you, can, you can get 35% of the vote and get majority of the congressional districts. In the if you're allowed to draw the districts. If district. you're allowed to draw the lines, yeah. So uh, the case before the Supreme Court, they actually have a test that the appeals court approved of to eliminate or to reduce political gerrymandering. That's hugely important because it hurts everybody. It hurts, it doesn't matter what party you're in, it hurts. And I, I want to see that eliminated. And I know I'm not on the Supreme Court, I don't know. I'm not going to be able to nominate anybody to the Supreme Court. But if you can put pressure, yeah, <laughs> even just putting pressure on your elected representatives, the state level elected representatives, you can have a not, huge impact. Not right? to gerrymander the district. Gerrymandering is not required, right? So it's you not could required. put the pressure on your local representatives not to yeah. do that. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. And let me ask you maybe a bit about the future because it sounds like you've been doing a lot of thinking about the future. What do you think about the idea of India banning AI drivers, the artificial intelligence drivers to preserve jobs? Do you think that we're, to me, the thing that we're not talking about enough is what is it going to look like and what should we be doing for human workers as the machines become much more capable? Yeah, that, that's probably one of the most difficult problems we, we face as far as our economy goes, is the, the fact that not that the economy is changing, the economy has always changed. It is the rate of change that is different. And people have to adjust to this. They have to adjust to this new rate of change, right? Right. We are going to have to provide training. It should be coupled to where the jobs are going. We're going to have to provide a safety net for families for while that training is going on. And that goes back to your single-payer idea, right? It would be a part of the safety net. Single-payer health care would be part of the safety net. But in, if you have a family to support and you've – your job has been eliminated and you have to do something new. Yeah. Training takes time. I know there's unemployment, but the unemployment limit shouldn't be whatever, what shouldn't be however long it is. It should be however long it takes you to learn the new skills. It should be however long it takes your family to learn your family members to, to get employed. So, yeah. And so to that point, right, there's the kind of Mike Rowe has been making a, you know, really big case for having more people go to trade schools and other non-college oriented training programs. Do you support that kind of thing? And what do you think we should be doing besides just supporting college? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it can't be just, I said, training in whatever the employers want. And that is going to differ from, you know, county to county. Right. Right. It's whatever is needed in that county. And on my website, I talk about free tuition. I think the concept of free t- college tuition for everybody is a wonderful concept if you buy into the idea that if you get a college degree, you're more valuable, which right. is true. And if you're more valuable, you pay more taxes and it benefits the, benefits everybody. But I think initially we need to make sure that we couple the type of education that's free to whatever's available in terms of jobs in that particular area. So even like trade school? Trade school would, yeah. If, if trade school is what's needed, that's what should be free. That's if great. a four-year college is what's needed, that's what should, should be free. If there's a nursing shortage in a certain area, then nursing majors should be, that should be free. You do that not because it's a handout. You do that because if you have more full employment in the areas which are growing, you help that growth. 
and that's that's what we're talking about here. Right. You keep the economy just moving yeah. with what's needed. Right. Yeah. You, you you help people out. You help people get to where they need to be. But you should focus that and get them. It's, I'm talking. What I'm really talking about here is something else everybody's heard about. How about getting the best bang for your buck? That's what I'm talking about here. Right. Okay. The best use of taxpayer funding. Right? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about here. And I've gotten pushback about, you know, what about history? Well, maybe there's places where history majors are needed. And that's probably a bad example because I love history. <laughs> Me too. And it's a, it's, a, it's a vital thing. But, for example, if history majors aren't needed where you happen to be living. Right. And that might not be free. Oh, interesting. Okay. So you're actually thinking about some kind of means testing for what should be subsidized. It would, it would be a means testing in, in, in terms of what types of jobs are needed where you are. So maybe demand testing, means yeah. testing is the wrong. And as a practical matter, people will probably move to the places that are hubs for whatever they're interested in. So it would, you would totally throw away the concept that you should do what you're interested in rather than what's economical. Right. Right. Oh, that's a fascinating idea. So in your work with supercomputing, has, has that given you any concepts of how you might do government a little bit differently, right? You're talking about big data concepts when you're talking super computing. Right, right, right. I mean, there, there is a lot of things you can learn from big data. There's a lot of things you can learn about disease. There's a lot of things you can learn about what types of programs work and what types of programs don't work. You know, there's a lot there. And climate is a big data problem. <laughs> right. Let's that's not right. forget, you know, you, you're, you're interviewing a scientist who does supercomputing. Let's not, <laughs> let's not, let's not skip over. Right now we have a hurricane coming on shore in Texas. And, and there's a hurricane coming on shore in Texas and, you know, super, supercomputers, they tell us about the future that's right. in many ways. You use them to figure out where that hurricane's going to hit, how intense it, how much, how fast it's going to intensify. Imagine if it hit Texas with no warning. It got a couple of days warning. We had that in Galveston, right, in 1911? Maybe, yeah, yeah. Like huge loss of lives. Right. A huge, huge loss of life in, in Galveston. They tell us about climate change, and that's going to be important. They're, they're going to be our eyes to tell us what's going to happen. Certain certain things are going to happen. They're, they're going to tell us you know, what we have to do about sea, where we have to build seawalls, where we have to worry about... You know, more rainfall, less rainfall. Climate change, the change is the thing that's, that's a problem. It's sort of like the problem people have adjusting to make a living in a rapidly changing economy. Right. The fact is not that the world is getting warmer, per se. It's right. the rate at which it's getting warmer, so the natural systems can't adjust. Sea level rise, if it takes a 1,000 years, isn't as big a problem as if it takes 100 years. Think of all our infrastructure that is near the ocean. We're going to see a lot of that after this hurricane, yeah. right? We're going to see. <laughs> yeah. Think about a direct effect of the carbon dioxide, ocean acidification. That's the CO2 levels going up in the ocean. I'm getting a little away from supercomputers. I'll no, no, that's right. all right. You're, you're there. The so. ocean acidification causes the shells, the, the plankton and things, or anything with a sea shell. Life, yeah. Yeah. It causes it to die. You're getting rid of part of the ecosystem of the ocean. Right. And if the oceans aren't doing well, the planet isn't doing well. And that's a direct effect. So every time CO2 is pumped into the atmosphere very, very rapidly in Earth's history, the climate has warmed up and die-offs have happened. Right. And this is no different. The fact that humans are doing it instead of a natural process really is that's neither here nor there. Right. It, it, it's good in a way in that we could stop it. Right, we can control how much CO two and how much methane we leave. Right, we can we can stop it. All right, getting back to supercomputers. Supercomputers also they design your cars, they design your airplanes, they find your drugs, they find things that we will use in the future. And they're very important things. And if you're denying the physics that designs your cars and designs the planes you fly in. If you deny that that physics, when it tells you something you don't like about climate, right, that makes no sense. You can't ignore what science is telling you just because it's telling you something you don't like. Right. Getting back to this problem where the emotional issue it's is an emotional issue. Yeah. And you know, I have I have a, a truck that I use for hunting and camping. But we drive our electric car around town, and we put most of the miles on an electric car. I like trucks. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, 
but you also understand you have some responsibility. You so. have responsibility. And maybe even more important that you have an ability to change things, right? You have ability. And, and, and by the way, a plug for electric cars, they're fun to drive. Zero to 60, oh my. Yeah. <laughs> I've actually driven an S10 EV1, uh-huh. which was when they were the EV1 program under GM. They built a few S10s. They were front wheel drive. There was a guy here in Santa Fe who owned one. Yeah. And he let me drive it once. It was pretty neat. But yes, they are a lot of fun to drive. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a Tesla Model Three on one Ooh. order. Excellent. I can't. I, I can't afford the Model S, but but I said, oh, the three yeah. is good. Model Three. I can. I can do. Well, or, since you go hunting here, I, I suppose the use of public lands is probably a big issue for you as well. It seems like it is for all New Mexicans. Right? Yeah, having yeah. these public lands available. Yeah, that that's a very important issue, actually. You know, we have these 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 beautiful natural areas where you can you can camp and you can hunt and you can fish right and they're open to everybody they're economic engines you know i've hired guides i've stayed in the hotels i've eaten at the restaurants i've i've done all that stuff and people make money off of these things absolutely yeah these are our public lands these, and we own them right we, so we own them and our uh, children will own them and, that's, and that's really i amazing they're not just there to be exploited further and for fossil fuels or anything else. Right. And so I, ver- I think it's very important to protect our, our public lands. Yeah, I think it's not good to put one type of value over another type of value, right? Like there, there's the value, the intrinsic value of just having the land available for people to use. Yeah. And there's value you could get from mining them or pulling oil out. Well, we should do some of that. But there's value in the watershed, cleaning the water that is used by the folks in the cities. There's value in taking CO2 out of the atmosphere from our national forest. There's all kinds of value there. There's habitat that's valuable. So, you know, I, Absolutely. I, make, I make use of the public lands. It's a tradition in my family The Friday after Thanksgiving, if we go to one of the national forests and get a Christmas tree. It's, 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 a, it's a great family outing. I, I want to protect them. Right. Not just for me, but for everybody. Yeah, and I think that's the best part about it is that you get to be selfish, but you're also helping other people, right? You get to enjoy it, and so does everyone else. You know, I'm not doing this because I have some ambition to be, you know, rich or powerful or famous or any of that stuff. I'm doing this because I genuinely want to help the country. I genuinely want to see things improve. I genuinely want to see something different happening in life. That's right. A I, lot of I, people are engaged now because they just feel this isn't the right. Yeah, way. yeah. And people are marching, and people are writing letters, and people are doing all kinds of things. I'm running for office. That's right. And so on that yeah. path, it sounds like there's certain milestones that you need to meet that will really help boost your campaign. Do you want to go into any of those at the moment? It sounds like you're getting some outside interest. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I'm having a lot of positive interest. The fact that I'm an outsider, the fact that I'm a scientist, is generating interest. The fact that I'm a scientist does not mean I'm going to win unless I have good ideas and I care and show I have good ideas about everything. Immigration, health care, Social Security. We didn't talk about defense. We didn't talk about a lot of things that I care about. Unless I show that I know what I'm doing in the political arena, nobody should vote for me just because I'm a scientist. And I think I can do that. I've been a political junkie all my life. I've been involved in uh, politics for most of my life. I was a young Democrat. I was an advisor for young Democrats. I was an old Democrat doing phone calls and fundraisers and things like that. I've never been the person at the top of the ticket, granted, but I've been around it. And it's often frustrating. It's often to get involved in politics. You often get to the point where you think things don't happen and they don't happen fast enough. But we don't have an alternative. We have to make this system work. We have to make the system work better. And I think the, uh, part of the reason so many people are getting involved that are not traditional politicians is that they're just sick and tired of things not happening and things not getting done and progress not being made. We have two parties, and just face it, they're at stalemate. And unless we can find creative ways of getting around that stalemate, nothing will ever get done. Well, with that, uh, please go check out Dennis's website at dingeforcongress.org. Thank you so much, Dennis, for taking time to talk with us. We look forward to hearing your campaign. Hey, Nation, we want to hear from you, our listeners. So go ahead and reach out to us on Facebook or give us a call at 202-681-2274. We might even play you on the show. 
Politics Within Reason is a project of the Party of Reason and Progress, a registered 527 political organization. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes or whatever you use to listen to your podcasts. Thanks for your support. And until next week, this is Politics Within Reason.